So now we're going to look at what does it mean to be a convergent series. Actually, before that, we'll do one more example. So we're going to find the sum, one more sum. Before this, I need to talk about partial sums. We're using the letter N to index, I think. Yeah, so we better not use. I'm going to go with capital N partial sum. <coughs> so we're going to use capital S, capital N for the partial sum. So this is the nth partial sum. So all it is is add up to the nth term. So don't go to infinity, just find some big n value and figure out what is the sum going up to that number. So why is this useful? Well, infinity is a hard thing to think about. So this is useful because it lets us uh, add up more and more and more terms without thinking about infinity right away. How? So certainly this is not true, that uh, partial sum is not equal to the full sum. How can I make this statement true? Remember, the partial sum only goes up to n. So so how do I how do I take the rest of it? How do I make that So I need to so we have a tool for way back in calc 1. We got a limit. I want to take the limit as capital N goes to infinity. So this will be equal if You could write this as s infinity if you want to. That's not really a standard way notation. Uh, but you can write it down if you want to. So that's what we mean by uh, partial sums. <coughs> but think about if you keep going and going and going. All right, so this will make sense as long as we can find a nice form for the nth sum. So if I know what the first n terms look like added together, and then I can use my uh, knowledge from limits and maybe L'Hopital's rule if needed. So this is what partial sums are. So we treat infinity by basically not treating infinity and then at the very end using limits. So we'll do an example. Find summation k equals a 1 to infinity. 1 over k times k plus 1. So the first step's not obvious, so I'll go ahead and write it out. We're going to use partial fractions. Partial fractions is a useful skill. I probably couldn't do it quite this fast. I'm just copying that out of my notes, but this is a really easy partial fraction to do. So what I want you to do is figure out what is S1, S2, S3. And then hopefully we'll find a pattern. Maybe we need to go to S4 
and then I want you to figure out what is the pattern for SN. And it should be relatively nice. So the way you figure out the pattern, you write enough partial sums until you can see the pattern. So I'll do the first one. So we got 1 over 1 minus 1 over 2. So S2, 1 over 1 minus 1 over 2, plus write down the next one. So that's the first term plus the second term. So write down the third and the fourth partial sum. And there is some reduction. You can absolutely reduce these. There should be some really nice cancellation happening. Another thing to notice about partial sums, S2 is S1 plus the second term. So you can think of partial sums is the one that came before it plus the next term. And of course, S3 is our partial sum with 2 plus the third term. And so that's the pattern that I use. I don't want to write out every single term. So I just took the partial sum above and just added the next term to it. What pattern do we have? I don't think we need to write down S4 necessarily. Anybody want to be brave and say what SN should be? So it should be 1 minus 1 over n plus 1. Yeah, so our S3 was 1 minus a fourth, or 1 minus uh, 1 over 3 plus 1. And of course, S4, if I wrote that out, that would be 1 minus a fifth. I would fall in that pattern. All right, I think we can take a limit as this thing goes, as n goes to infinity now. This part is the easiest part of the problem. What is this limit? One. One. So our second term gets smaller and smaller. So we're going to get one. There's going to be a few homework problems on partial sums, but I'm not going to put the, uh, I don't plan to put the partial sums on your quiz or final. So it's a skill that is useful, but I won't put that specific skill on your quizzes or final. Um, that's how you use partial sums. So if you can find a pattern, then you could say, well, what happens if this pattern keeps going? If you can't find a pattern, then partial sums aren't going to help you. Sometimes there's a pattern, sometimes not. So now we're going to look at divergent versus convergent series. So we'll just define convergent. So we saw what a convergent sequence was. It was when your terms settled down 
and got very close to a single number. So convergent series, what this means is your series, if you add it all together, you get a number. You get a finite number. And this only makes sense on an infinite series. So series converges if it doesn't matter where we start, usually 0 or 1. So if you add up the infinite terms and you get a single number. So where L is some real number. Specifically, not infinity, not negative infinity. If you get an infi infinity or negative infinity, that is divergent. So if you add up your infinite terms, you get a number, you converge. And of course, diverge, you add them up, and you don't get a number. Could be infinity, could be negative infinity, could be something else. So you add up, not a number, you're divergent. Now, why do I say that we need an infinite series for this to make sense? Well, if you add up a finite number of numbers, what do you get? Another number. Might be big if the numbers are positive, might be small or negative if the numbers are all negative, but either way, even if there's a million of them, you eventually could add them all together, or at least a computer could add them all together, and you would get a number. So finite series always converges. So they're kind of boring in that sense. When you just add up a finite number of numbers, you're gonna get another number. So we're not going to look very much at finite series. So we have a theorem. If summation a n, and I'm going to stop writing the n equals 0 or 1, because it doesn't have to start at 0 or 1, but uh, it could start really any number. But if our <coughs> series converges, Then, all right, then on the next line, limit n approaches infinity, a n uh, has to equal zero. So let's think about this theorem for a minute. If you add up an infinite number of numbers, so you add up an infinite number of numbers and you get a finite value, those numbers have to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So if they don't get smaller than a certain, let's say they never get smaller than one, right, right there you know that this would not add up to a finite value. You would hit infinity or negative infinity. So this just says if your series converges, your terms have to get very small. So I'm going to write something that's not a theorem. Well, let's Let's write it in more simple notation, or math notation. So this arrow is implies. So if you have what's on the left, then you have what's on the right. So if your infinite sum is a number, then a n approaches zero. And I'll just use lazy limit notation. A n has to approach zero. You want to be careful, this is not a theorem.
So this is the I forgot the word for this, not the contrapositive. That one's the same. To the inverse or the converse? I don't know which of the two. When you flip your arrow around. Um, I think it's the inverse because you turned your arrow backwards. Um, so this is not a theorem. So just because your terms get small doesn't mean that they add up to a finite value. We'll see uh, examples of that. Um, we didn't add this up as a series, but if you go from uh, 1 to infinity, 1 over x dx, antiderivative is natural log, and we'll get infinity. However, the terms got really small. They kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we added up terms getting smaller and smaller and still got infinity. So you have to be careful. So if it converges, that means your limit, you know, your terms have to get very small. So the contrapositive Talk a little bit about logic, and then I'm using these fancy words. So we tend to think of ourselves as logical creatures, although most of us don't know any actual formal logic. But it doesn't stop us from thinking we're logical. So if A, then B. If you're lazy, you write it out like this. So this says, if A is true, then B is true. So that's the way we write out um, most of our theorems in math. You've got a hypothesis, you've got a conclusion. Very different than science, uh, where hypothesis and conclusion mean something completely different. So we have three different versions of this. So we'll start out with the two that are not equivalent. So B implies A. Uh, this is the inverse. It might be nicer to write A on the left. Let's do that. So we'll go like that. So that's what we call the inverse. And the converse, it sort of looks like A implies B, except we're going to put not in front of each of those. So that little sideways L means not. All right, so those two are not equivalent. Now, the last one is a contrapositive. Turns out if you do both of these, it is equivalent. So contrapositive looks like not B implies not A. So we're going to use the non-math theorem that I created. If I get food poisoning, and I vomit. All right. Is there two ends in poisoning? No. But if it's a consonant followed by ing, except when we don't want to, then we don't double our consonant. OK, makes sense. All 
All right, so if I just summarize it, food poisoning applies vomiting. All right, so <laughs> let's look at the uh, non-equivalent ones. So let's turn this arrow around. All right, what happens if you see vomiting? Maybe that means my cat ate my dog's food, but didn't get food poisoning, just ate something it should be eating, all right? So you can't say that the dog food has uh, got something rancid in it, because the dog eats it just fine, all right? So that's definitely not the same thing. What about the, let's go for the converse, not food poisoning implies not vomiting. This would be correct if vomiting was only caused by food poisoning. But 4th of July is coming up. There may be some vomiting that day. Um, St. Patrick's Day just went by. That's probably the day of this theorem. Uh, so just because you know that your food that you've been eating has been good, there's no guarantees about uh, not vomiting. You can say there's a less chance if you know um, that you didn't get food poisoning, but you can't definitively use this theorem. So those are similar, but logically not equivalent. So let's look at the contrapositive now. All right, so you know that there is no vomiting going on. So if there was food poisoning going on, there'd be a problem. Because if there was food poisoning, you would not be observing no vomiting. So this is the contrapositive. So if there's not vomiting, there could not have been food poisoning before. So we're about to use the contrapositive of a theorem I just wrote down. So we're going to go not uh, on both of them, and then turn the implication backwards. So contrapositive is logically equivalent and useful. So contrapositive of this theorem right here. So we're going to go with the conclusion, and we're going to assume not conclusion. Whoa. Yeah, not conclusion. So limit of the terms is not zero. Now, it might be another number, it might be infinity, it might be negative infinity, or it may do something weird like 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. So there's lots of ways for it to not equal 0. Uh, but if your limit's not 0, then what can I conclude? Does not converge. So it's the opposite of what our original hypothesis was. So actually, let's write not converge, because that will diverge means the same thing, but this means exactly a contrapositive. And this is what we call the nth term test for divergence. So the only conclusion you can draw <coughs> is uh, if your limit is not going to approach zero, you can say our sequence has to, or our series has to diverge. However, if you test it and your limit a n equals zero, you can't conclude anything. So no, nothing. Just like if you don't see vomiting, you can't really make any conclusions at that point. No. Mm 
this is, oh, if you do see vomiting, you can't make conclusions at that point. All right, so if you try your nth term test and you get zero, you cannot apply your nth term test. So you gotta try something else. Now it's not gonna be obvious when to use the nth term test for divergence in general. Uh, you kind of have to use intuition, just look and say, hey, if my terms are not getting small, there's no way I'm going to converge. And that's when you apply your nth term test. Is it possible for neither to happen, or is it always possible? Uh, so if we look at the nth term test, so your limit of your terms either is zero or it's not. So there's no, if it's, you know, point 0.1, it's not zero. So getting close to zero, I mean the limit means the terms are getting close to zero, but if the limit itself is not actually equal to zero, then you don't converge. So if your limit was uh, something small but not zero, it would diverge. So you can't be close to zero. You have to, the limit has to be zero. Uh, but I don't want to get too much into limits, but that just means it's getting, the terms themselves are getting arbitrarily close to zero. So let's prove divergence. Now, just to warn you, the quiz and final, exa uh, final exam problems, I'm going to give you, I'm not going to tell you prove divergence or prove convergence. I will ask you, does this converge or diverge? And I want you to show me why. So in general, I'm not going to tell you what's happening. So you're gonna have to decide, is it converging or diverging? And then figure out how do I show that's happening? So prove divergence. So just use the nth term test. So tell me what happens when n approaches infinity. What's happening to all of our terms here? Oh, the second one I meant to use the letter K, not the letter N everywhere. So the little N at the bottom should be a K. All right, what is the limit of negative one to the N when N gets really big? So you're either gonna have negative one or positive one, negative one, positive one. So does it get close to either of those two? No matter which one you pick, you're still going to see the other term show up. So if you pick one, you're still going to have terms that are negative one, negative one, negative one. If you pick negative one, you're still going to have every other term is positive one, positive one, positive one. So in this case, we have the limit does not exist. So does not exist is definitely not equal to zero. The second limit might be a little easier to see. What is the limit as k approaches infinity? One. So it is one. You could use L'Hopital's rule. Take a derivative and derivative. You get one over one plus zero. Or you can use a physicist method and think about that plus one is not going to matter. So k over k 
going to approach 1. Well, 1 is definitely not 0. So this also diverges by the nth term test. The nth term test is probably the fastest test to apply. Really, really fast. You're taking one limit, and if you don't get 0, it does not converge. So while we're on divergence, one more divergence theorem. So if this an diverges, then the following are also divergent. Then the following. So the first one is a number times a n. Uh, this will diverge. There is one c value that this actually converges for. So this is 0. You would add up an infinite number of zeros. So we keep going 0 plus 0 plus 0. We're going to get 0. So this diverges when c is not 0. Why does it converge? Because you can factor your c out. So if you factor your c out, you're just adding up something that's not a number times c. So this one diverges. The next one if you add up a n plus another infinite series bn, this will never converge. This will always diverge. This diverges even when an is negative bn. So why did I write if an is negative bn? Well, if an is negative bn, what is an plus bn? Zero. Well, thinking about this, well, doesn't that mean every pair of terms adds up to zero? Yes, that's exactly what it means. However, why can I not write this out? Let's think about what's happening here. So this is the end of the theorem right here, but the intuition of what's happening. Let's say we're starting at 1, a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus, now I'm going to cheat and write a infinity, even though obviously there is no a infinity. If I want to think about lining up a n plus b n, what, how do I cancel a1 and b1. What I have to do is I have to bring b1 over to here. So I have to rearrange the terms. And so they would cancel out if I could rearrange the order. The problem is, how many terms are here? Infinity. infinity. So I just have to bring B1 past an infinite number of terms, one at a time, which unfortunately takes an infinitely long time to do. So you can't actually rearrange it unless I knew that what I just is ta I'm talking about, unless this whole thing is a number like 7, in which case, no problem. You could bring that past 7. So you can only rearrange terms if you know it converges.
you know each part converges. So that's not equal to what's above it. So infinite terms, or I can just say terms can only be rearranged when all sequences involved converge. So there's somewhere floating around some fake proof where you add up some positive numbers and get negative pi or negative pi over 6 or something like that. Uh, the way they prove that is they rearrange terms on a series that doesn't converge, which is not okay to do. So you only rearrange when all sequences involved converge. So we're going to find a, actually we're going to find two sums. So this will be our last example in this section before we move into the testing section. So we only know two ways to find sums right now. One way is write out partial sums, and hopefully there's a pattern. There's a second way. How do we find sums last week? We'll scroll back up. So we did find some sums. Ah, geometric series. So we can either go partial sums or we can Write it as a geometric series. So let's think about this right here. And I'm going to rewrite this down below. So this only vaguely looks like a geometric series. The first thing preventing it from looking like a geometric series, there's a subtraction in the numerator. Now I say vaguely because we do have numbers raised to powers. So it's got some of the properties that we need, but uh, not all the properties we need. So how can I s do something? What algebra can I do? So let's turn our fraction into the difference of two fractions. So we're going to take our fraction right here. All we're going to do is this move right here. So super easy algebra, algebra 1. Now, did I rearrange terms? No. I didn't. I took the first term and wrote it as a difference of two terms. Took the second term, wrote it as a difference of two terms. So I didn't do any rearranging. We're about to do some rearranging, though. And I'm going to write this equal sign over here on the right. I'm going to write a super big equal sign on purpose. I'm going to write something underneath it in a minute. Am I rearranging terms here?
So I'll write in blue, I'll just write out maybe the first two terms over here. So the first two terms look like three to the zero over six minus one sixth plus, that's the first term, second term, three over six squared minus one over six squared plus et cetera, et cetera. What on the right side, what's going on over here? We got three to the zero over six plus uh, three to the first over six squared plus dot, 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 plus, so there's an infinite number of terms in those dots. Got to go all the way to infinity. And then I have my next term, which is 1 6 plus 1 6 squared plus another infinite number of terms. Oh, I'm actually subtracting all these here. So I rearrange an infinite number of terms here. So on the left side, all the green stuff is mixed in with the blue. So I rearrange infinite number of terms here. When am I, when am I not allowed to rearrange terms? When, when I diverge. So this equal sign, I have to be careful when all sequence uh, series converge. So it's not going to be equal unless everything converges. So I'm not sure that they're equal yet. So what I'm going to do on the right side is, can I get two numbers, one for each of these infinite series? Can I get two numbers out of this? If I can, it's going to be equal to what's on the left side. If I get infinity for even just one of them, then they're not going to be equal. I want you to figure out what is the sum of each of these. And you should get a finite number. I think the second one's a little easier than the first one. So figure out what these sums are. And I'll give you a minute to do the second one. It's going to be a little bit easier than the first one. isn't written in the exact same form as geometric series, you just have to change that form. It should be not hard to do. <laughs> so what is R right here? Not 6. That won't converge. So you can write as 1, 6. But there's the second problem is that we're not starting at 0. So you got to deal with that problem also. You can do deal with it with addition, or you can go with multiplication. It doesn't matter which one you go with. We did this like Thursday, maybe even Wednesday. So you got to deal with that multiplication or addition.
So I'm going to choose to go multiplicative instead of additive. You can go either way, it doesn't matter. So what I'm going to do is force k to 0. And to compensate, I'm going to boost up the k to uh, plus 1. And at the same time, I'll write it as 1 6 to the k plus 1. So I'm dropping my k value from starting at 1 to 0. But to compensate, I still need the first term to have an exponent of 1. So I just say, all right, start k at 0, and I'm just going to add 1 to it. So our first term will have 1 as the exponent. So any questions on that right there? So this is almost in the right form for the uh, geometric series, except that stupid plus 1 that I had to put in there. So what algebra do I do from here? How do I get rid of that plus 1? Minus 1. Well, I can't just subtract 1 because I feel like it. Wouldn't it be <coughs> 6 minus k? 6 to the power of negative k? Uh, I could write it like that, but I want to. Here's my geometric series, so I want it to look like that. So I don't want to. I mean, I could write this as 1 over r to the negative n, but I think that's just extra confusing. So I'm going to leave it in this, in this form. So we can factor out 1 sixth. So 1 sixth times the 6 to the k, that's 6 to the k plus 1. All right, we did all this last week, I'm pretty sure. We factored out, I think we even factored out something squared or cubed. And of course, from here, you can factor out 1 sixth. It's got no uh, k in it, so it's not going to change. So it's constant multiple. So we're going to ask 1 sixth. <coughs> now, finally, this is in the perfect form. Start at 0, we got r to the k. And this r is definitely less than 1. And unfortunately, we got a fraction of fractions, but that's not hard to deal with. That's 5 6. Reciprocated is 6 fifths. That's negative 1 fifth. All right, so that part converges. So that's one part. Now we're going to go to the other part. How in the world can we deal with this? The exponents don't even match. Well, let's force them to match. That's definitely not equal. What can I multiply by to make it equal? Either a third or three to the negative one. So three to the k times three to the negative one is three to the k minus one. So it's just algebra, probably algebra one stuff right here. Don't be intimidated by the summation when you're doing algebra. You're just doing algebra. So this 1 third or 3 to the negative first has no k in it, so we can bring it out to the front. So let's go ahead and do that. So we got 1 third summation, k equals 1 to infinity. How can I treat 3 to the k over 6 to the k? I can rewrite that. They're both to the k power, so I could bring the power outside and write it as 1 half to the k power, or 3 6 to the k power. That. So that's a half. We're almost there. What is the last problem that we have? Our starting k is 1. Starting k is 1. 
So we just got to shift back. So we could start it k equals 0 to infinity. 3, 6 is a half to the k plus 1. So we dropped it by 1, so we compensate. And finally, this is an extra half right here. So we'll factor out the half. So one third times a half, one sixth. And this is set up perfectly for a geometric uh, series. So one minus a half is uh, one half. Reciprocated is two over one, so that is a third, and this is some fifteenths. So we get two fifteenths. So everything written down on the right side of the equal sign is 2 fifteenths. And because we got convergent, convergent, we can now go back across the equal sign at 2 fifteenths. It, it is actually equal. So we got that they both converged. So I can take off question mark. They are equal. They converged. So our sum is 2 fifteenths. If I got infinity or something else that wasn't a number for either one of these, I would say they diverge up here. So if one of those two diverged, actually, no, I couldn't say that. I'd have to try something different. Uh, just because one of the two diverges, all that means is they're not necessarily the same. So just because the right side diverges, that means that it may or may not be equal. We don't know anything. Uh, but the fact they both converge means that I can rearrange the terms and they add up to the same thing. Whoa, time to leave.